If you are a Lego investor, someone who buys Lego sets before manufacturing ends and then watches the values skyrocket, this is going to be for you because I get the opportunity to speak to so many different successful Lego investors around the world, ranging from people who have multiple six-figure businesses selling sealed retired Lego sets, but also to people who sell used Lego sets or minifigures or have brick and mortar stores. And in my discussions with a lot of these different successful Lego investors, I've been able to uncover a ton of the different things that makes them successful. So in this video, I'm going to give this all to you right here in one place. I'm actually going to summarize some of the biggest tips that we have seen in some of the interviews that I've done with super successful people in the space of selling Lego sets. I'm going to break down some of the golden nuggets that were dropped in some of these interviews and just bring them to you here in one quick and easy place. So you're going to want to buckle up for this one. And we're going to jump straight in here with Sean from Brickville in Australia. Sean is a brick and mortar store owner. He started out with Lego investing a couple of years ago. He joined my inner circle program. He learned everything that he could about investing in Lego sets and building a business. And then he opened a brick and mortar store in Melbourne, Australia. And since then, Sean's success has been absolutely incredible. And in my interview with Sean, he dropped so many incredible knowledge bonds. But let's just jump in and look at one that I thought was really, really interesting. One of the big triggers for me was when one guy came in and bought a set that I had new for about $150 and it was a Black Widow set and it had Taskmaster in it. It's a Marvel character. And the guy just wanted the minifig. He didn't care at all about the set. And he just, he paid the $150 for the set just so that he could get the minifig because he didn't want to have to try and find it online. And he brought back the set without the minifig and said, do you want it? He didn't even care about getting any money for it. He just gave it back to me. <laughs> and that, that was a big trigger for me going, I need more minifigs. So I went out and sourced as many many things as I could and I, I probably accumulated about 80% of those mini figures were worth nothing um, you know or next to nothing they're just you know cops and um, you know firemen but I pulled all the heads off and put them in a little minifig factory and I'd paid less than a dollar for most of those and now kids come in and they build their own mini figures and uh, they pay six dollars for them and their parents love that because they can just drop by on the way home from school and it keep, it's like a little reward for their children and so in three months I've sold over 600 mini figures it's probably my, one of my best inventory wise best you know physical sellers yeah but it sounds like it's a constant sourcing effort right are you finding yeah. you need you need to find people to give you a constant supply of minifigures so that it's probably less work right yeah so what, what i'm doing now is actually going to people that have good stock in their bricklink store and offering them money to buy the entire store now sean has given us multiple lessons in just this little clip so firstly he mentioned that he noticed that one of the people who came into his store were looking for the taskmaster ambush minifigure and they gave him the entire set they just wanted the minifigure they paid full price for it what what did Sean do next? He decided that he had to source lots of minifigures. The reason he did that is because he was listening to what his customers wanted. He was listening to the demand of his customers. We need to do the same thing as Lego investors, Lego sellers. We need to be looking at the marketplace. What is the market demand? What do people want? This simple fact that Sean paid attention to what this customer was looking for and then took action on it shows his business acumen and his business knowledge. And honestly, this seems like such a small thing, but the success that followed because he went into minifigures following this one experience was critical for his business and that one little decision came from listening to one of his customers and that is a lesson that we can take from him now secondly what else do we learn here sean was thinking outside of the box because he learned that he had to buy all of these minifigures and start selling minifigures in his store but after he sourced a lot of minifigures a lot of them were not very valuable so what did sean do he took the minifigures apart and put a build your own minifigure section into his store that is thinking outside of the box because he knew he didn't want to sell all of those bad minifigures or the less valuable minifigures individually and they probably wouldn't sell in his stores so he took the more valuable ones out to sell fully and then he sold all the rest of them as parts where people can come in and build their own minifigure and that is not all because again in this little snippet from Sean we got another incredible lesson and that is the partnership that he built with a bricklink seller because he realized I'm gonna have to source a ton of these minifigures because the volume that I'm selling in my store is so high and for many people that effort of sourcing would actually be acting like grass 
gravity pulling you back down, when you see this opportunity and you can't reach for it because gravity is pulling you back down to earth, you have to source all this inventory, you don't have enough time, you're trying to run your new store and you just can't get the inventory that you need, what did Sean do? He went to a partner, he went to a Bricklink seller and asked them, will you sell me all of your stock? And so that's the kind of stuff that Sean is doing. He's building partnerships, he's outsourcing some of the work to other people, he is taking action quickly and he's making sure that he's getting that inventory without much work by buying it in bulk from Bricklink sellers and building partnerships. So this little snippet from Sean, I just thought was absolutely incredible because we got three lessons that I think are really important for running a Lego investing or Lego selling business. And whether it is online or brick and mortar, we can all use these three lessons from Sean. All right, so now let's just jump over to another interview that I did with Jared from Life in Pieces. And Jared has a really interesting Lego business where he has a Bricklink store selling Lego parts, but also he actually does designs and he does mock creations. And here I asked Jared the question about how he grew his Bricklink store so quickly. What was the mindset that he went into it with? Was he immediately planning on scaling to a certain level? Or how did he approach the beginning of his Bricklink store? And I thought his answer here was super interesting. Let's have a look. I started slowly. Um, I quickly realized, and, and through watching some YouTube videos, and also just kind of like looking at the top stores uh, on Bricklink, like the top performers that they have every month, and why are they the top performers? What do they have that I don't? Why can they set their prices three times what I can set and yet still sell in a volume. And it's just, you know, the, the, the variety and the volume of parts they have, you know, um, I always keep several thousand of, of each major tile in stock now, because I know th there's just the time where somebody goes in and buys them all. And I know that because I do that sometimes. Right. So, you know, it's a, uh, it, it's, it's a huge advantage to have. Um, but it, but it, yeah, it was more looking at what makes other stores work and, and trying to figure it out. I mean, you, it, it's kind of like throwing, uh, throwing darts at the board with your eyes closed because you don't really understand exactly how things are promoted sometimes. You know, mm -hmm. why, why did I go lower in the wanted list even though I have the same exact amount of parts what, what, that you need? What, what is, the, you know, what is the, the deciding factor? And uh, so just, you know, adding more and more of the, the lot count definitely helps. Right, so this is super interesting and there's one really, really important takeaway that I get out of this. Now, if you're a Bricklink seller, you can take Jared's advice here and what he's specifically saying is that the more lots you have, the more different types of parts you have on Bricklink, the more different inventory you have, then the more sales you will make because you're getting people in the door and that will help all of your sales overall. And the same thing is true for brick and mortar store owners, of course. But what I actually wanna highlight here from Jared is not even that. Here's what I think is really interesting about his response here is that he took the time when he was first starting his business to analyze what all of the other Bricklink stores were doing. And this is a step that I just don't see enough people do when they're starting their Lego investing or Lego reselling business. Stopping and looking around and looking at the other stores. Now, if you sell on Amazon, pick a Lego listing, go and look at the sellers on the listing, open up those seller stores and look at what else they're selling. You can look at what prices they have set under inventory. You can look at what themes that they're typically selling. What areas do they specialize in? You can do the same thing on eBay. You can do it on Bricklink. So regardless of whether you sell sealed sets, used sets, minifigures, or parts on Bricklink, you can do this. And if you are a brick and mortar store, you can also do this by going into other people's stores. We should always be analyzing what is going on in the market. What are other sellers doing? What makes them tick? What is the inventory that they have? What makes them successful? And when Jared started out, he quickly decided that he was just gonna look at the top Bricklink stores. What are the most successful stores out there? And how are they so successful? What do they have that I don't have? And how do I bridge that gap? And I become like them so I can also have the same success that they do. So Jared just mentioned this in passing like it was no big deal. And I loved that he did that because I know from talking to so many brand new Lego investors that it is a step that most people ignore and don't follow. And it is so important if you are starting a business or any sort of venture and you want to be successful, look at the people who have trailblazed before you and achieved the success that you are trying to achieve. All right, so now I'm going to jump over to my interview with Fred from Hillian's Bricks. And Fred is a successful Lego investor and Bricklink store owner out of the UK. He also makes content about Lego selling. And in this one, I asked him the question about life as a Lego seller in the UK when it comes to sourcing. How do you source your inventory? Are the deals as big as they are in the US? Or, you know, if they're not, how do you get around it? And how do you be strategic about how you source your inventory in the UK? Now, the answer that Fred gave is not only useful to people in the UK, because there's something we can all learn from what he said here. So let's take a look. Uh, the stimulus is that you get to the US, but right. they're very hard to get as well, right? And they're not 
widely advertised. It's pretty much you go in the store and you, you see it. But then you have regular clearances on stores like Argos, which is like a catalog store. Uh, and then <laughs> the next day, Amazon price match a lot of the, st- the sets. So uh, Amazon pretty much got a strategy here of killing the, the high street. So they, they just actively target a lot of the, the high streets as soon as they put a, a, a discount on, they just price match it. So mm-hmm. from a reseller perspective, you can buy a lot of good stuff. So uh, you often have limits on the catalog stores or they don't have them in store. And then you just try and get it from, from Amazon or vice versa, right? So, um, but there's, there's a lot of deals to be had throughout the year. If you, if you keep looking, as I said earlier, it's not just Amazon in the UK. We also get the benefit of France and Germany and Spain. Yeah. The, different, the difficulty that we have now with Brexit is that, you know, duty. So you can't really buy the bigger sets because you start getting import duties on them. But yeah, this, I would say you can get deals through a lot of periods throughout the year. Uh, there are some months where you're not going to find anything, but now October is just, you see a lot of deals already happening. Um, I think it was back in May or June. We had some Amazon France. Sometimes there's some crazy deals where you get like, you, you, bu- you buy three for the price of two. And, and that, that includes uh, sets that are already discounted. So they've already wow. discounted the sets oh. and then you get three for two. Uh, so sometimes <laughs> you can get really good deals. I think we, we, like a lot of people on our channel just uh, started buying lots of Lego sets, like the the 501st Legion battle packs. Like they worked out at like 15 pounds a unit when they're normally like 25 pounds. So we just, a lot of people just stocked up on those when those came through. <laughs> now, here's the interesting thing about what Fred is saying here. He's talking about specific places to source inventory, Argos and Amazon and different countries that you can order from if you live close to Europe. Here's the thing though. What I actually take away from Fred's response here is that he is being strategic with his approach to this he mentioned that he sources inventory throughout the year he's not dependent on one time of the year like some people in the u.s tend to be a lot of people wait until q4 to do all of their buying or prime day or the walmart clearance seasons and fred is basically saying and he expanded a little bit on it in different parts of this interview but he's basically saying that in the uk they can just spread their buying out across the year a little bit better and they can still get great deals you just have to think outside of the box a little bit so he mentioned that argos would have a sale but they then Amazon would match the prices. And so he would go to Amazon across Europe and buy the best prices that he can get. And that is essentially not taking it at a face value like a lot of people do. They would just buy the stuff from Argos when the sale happens. But if you price match or if you go to other retailers that are price matching, you can get more quantity. A lot of the times you can get cash back on your credit cards and different things like that. And it's really just all about being strategic and being patient to get the best deals possible. So what we're seeing from Fred here is the ability to think outside the box and look across the board at different sourcing options in some cases that may be other countries that are close to you that can ship to you and we're seeing a patience and a discipline with spreading out the buying across the year to make sure you're getting the best prices so that will help you to avoid overpaying for your inventory and depending on where you are in the world you may tailor your strategy to your market and for some people the deals may be heaviest in certain periods of time so you may go deeper during that time but then other countries may have more sporadic deals throughout the year and then you're going to have to pace your buying out a little bit more and tap into other markets that are close by. So when it comes to buying your inventory at great prices, definitely some lessons here that we can learn from Fred from Hillian's Bricks. All right, now we're going to jump over to my interview with Rarity Bricks. Now this is Yoart and he is in South Africa and they don't have Amazon or eBay there to sell on. And so what he has done is built his own Shopify store to sell his Lego sets on. Super interesting business model. He is a Lego investor and buys Lego sets and waits for values to go up. And my question here was around how to balance your full-time job with your Lego business because he actually has a demanding career and here we are seeing a really successful business and a demanding career being done simultaneously successfully. So let's jump into what Yort had to say in response to this. It's absolutely doable Shane. I mean I've got a quite a demanding job um, and and you know I think that the, the, the answer is just time management. I think it's important to to be realistic and see what time you have available and then use it as effective as possible. Um, and, and to also, you know, especially if you do, you know, if you go the direction that I am, it's not to put too much pressure on yourself is that to say, you know, I can, I can do this, but I can't do that. So either, you know, I don't go in that direction or I, you know, sort of compromise somewhere else. Um, I have a very, so there are times I'm really busy. So obviously our, our Q4 time is also quite busy and I will often spend a weekend, you know, busy with uh, packaging and sending out invoices and, you know, with the, with the sort of customer service type of things but you know during the rest of the year because the sales come in regularly and they and they likely spread out to a large extent um i just allocate time using the evenings um you know 
check what needs to be done, what needs to go out. Um, initially, it was a lot of work because, you know, things were maybe not as streamlined and you're sort of still figuring things out. But as you mature the business more and, and you understand the processes better and you can automate and streamline better, it really becomes second, you know, secondary habit. Um, I think that's you know, the other important thing is just make sure that you've got your processes in place. Make sure that you have templates of everything so that you don't have to you know, type the same email over and over again. You can, you can actually have a template in the background that you just tweak here and there. Make sure it's still personal, but you don't have to write the entire email or the, right, you know, the communication through. So there are little things that you can do here and there and absolutely doable. I mean, I spend on average maybe four weeks a week, four hours, sorry, four hours a week. That's just such a great response because what he's really saying here is that systems, processes, and templates allow him to run his business in four hours per week. And Yoard's business here, honestly, is a lot more demanding than a lot of us have when it comes to selling Lego online because he has to do things that some of us who sell on Amazon, eBay, or Bricklink don't have to do, such as marketing and getting people to actually come to look at what you have available for sale. And he has been able to do this while balancing a full-time demanding career. And really what it comes down to is processes and systems. Now, I couldn't agree more with this because it's the same experience that I've had in my business. I also work a full-time job and the only reason that I've been able to also build businesses on the side of my full-time job is by templatizing everything and building systems. And this can be done in so many different ways inside of your business. So for example, a couple of days ago, I was on our inner circle monthly meeting inside of my Ignite community and one of our members was walking through how he case packs his inventory. And that involves when all of the inventory shows up first, when you first buy it, actually prepping it for sale right there and then so you don't have to handle the inventory twice. And with the case packing Amazon FBA method, you can actually really, really simplify the work that is involved with selling your inventory and have it super streamlined and easy to do. And this is just an example of one system that you can implement to speed things up so that you have less time that you got to put into this thing. Another example is if you fulfill your own orders, then look at your workspace where you ship your inventory from because you want to have a computer, you want to have your label printer, you want to have your shipping scale, your tape and your packing material all with within reach. You don't want things to be messy and all over the place because then it's going to take you a lot more time and headspace to actually fulfill orders. So super important lesson here from your art from Rarity Bricks and take this as your cue to right now think about a new system you can implement in your business to streamline and simplify things and save yourself some time. All right, so now we're going to jump over to my interview with Tony from Build a Brick and Build a Brick are in New Zealand and it's a Bricklink store. Also did some really interesting things with monthly Lego boxes subscriptions and different things like that. And in this question that we got from a viewer, this was around how do you convince your wife to join your Lego business? And this is a common concern that we have from Lego investors and Lego resellers because it is a bit crazy to other people what we are trying to do. We are trying to build our wealth by selling and investing in Lego sets. And some people think it looks absolutely insane when you take one of your spare rooms in your home and fill it with Lego sets with the intention of selling it next year for double the price. So a lot of the concerns that I hear from brand new Lego investors is that they don't get the support that they need from their spouse, from their family members. And if their wife is not on board and doesn't want them to spend their savings on Lego sets to start a business, then it's going to be very hard for them to ever be able to achieve success with this. And so one of the things we have to do is to get our partners on board with this thing and show them that we are not crazy, that we have done our research and what we're going to be doing here is going to work. Now, I asked this question to Tony before before this point, we talked a little bit about actually getting your wife to work with you on your business. Uh, but what I want to focus on here is actually not about asking your wife to work with you on the business. It's more just about getting their acceptance. How do you get your wife or husband to buy into the idea of you actually doing this business, investing your savings or your real estate, some of your spare rooms and different things into this crazy business and your dream and vision? And here is what Tony's response was. Um, I guess uh, help educate them, um, you know, when when I first started, before I started Bricklink, um, and I, I did a whole lot of research, I watched Brick Arena, um, I watched um, Brickstar, and I did research. It was one of those things that when I watched a good video that had some, some good information in it, I would be, you know, here, have a look at this video. You know, this is something that I, this is a direction I want to go down, um, and that's how we first started. Um, so she watched a couple of the videos. I watched a lot of the videos, and we sort of, you know, she could see where I was going with it. So, you know, we, there was a point where, 
um, you know, we had an idea and, and, and we've changed and we've gone into Bricklink. You know, there was a point there. Um, so helping educate her was probably the piece that, that helped a lot. Um, so then she could see, all right, this is what I want to achieve and this is how we're going to do it, you know? And folks, this is so important. He's really saying education, right? Help to educate your partner to understand the things that you now understand because we were all at some point without any information or knowledge about this thing that we're doing. At one point, I didn't know anything about Lego investing and then when I discovered it, I started to understand it and I just went down the rabbit hole of learning more and more about it. But we got to remember that the people around us don't have that knowledge and they haven't done that research. They don't see the eBay sold comps that I was looking at. They don't see that I looked at the MSRP of this set and it was $100 and now it's $400 and it's actually selling for $400 two years later. And when you try to explain it to people, most people have doubts about it. They think, oh, there's no way that that's actually selling for triple the MSRP after two years until they see it. And so it involves education. It involves showing the data and showing the results to the people around us. And so Tony's example here is to show them the videos. If you are watching videos and getting pumped about the business opportunity, that you have show those videos to your spouse and so they can see what may be possible and they can see the process and understand that it's not as scary as they might think about I would also add to this to show actual results and like I said eBay comps eBay sales is a great way to do this you can actually go on eBay search for a Lego set and you can pick any retired Lego set from three years ago most likely you're gonna pick one that has gone up in value a little bit not all Lego sets go up in value but a lot of them do and if you go back far enough most of them do and of course some sets are much better than others but just to illustrate the point here just pick a couple of sets search on eBay and show those current selling prices when compared to those MSRP values and with some education on what is possible you can get your spouse to really see the vision that you have and understand what you're trying to achieve now during your first year as a Lego investor it's not going to be easy because you're not making sales right away we have a bit of hold time after we buy our inventory before we actually sell the inventory because values are going up and we don't want to miss out on that and so while you are waiting for values to go up and you're watching those prices climb, share that with your spouse. If you bought the Lego Thor's hammer a couple of months ago for $70, right now it's $160, which by the way, it actually is in reality, then you've just made an incredible return on investment. Even if you have not yet sold the inventory, tell your wife that the price is now $160 and you bought it for $70. Start to share some of the things that are exciting and that are happening in the business as soon as possible, even if you're not yet selling. And then after you sell and you actually get the profits, bring your partner, your wife or your husband out for a nice steak dinner and thank them for believing in your venture and let them know that tonight's dinner is on the Lego profits and they will quickly come around to what you are trying to achieve. So great insights from Tony here on the idea of education in order to get the buy-in from the people around us. So, so important if we want to achieve our dreams and have that support from our partners. All right, so now let's jump over to my interview with Paul and Evan from Just a Brick in the Bucket. And my question to them was around partnerships because the guys have a YouTube channel and they talk about their Brickling store and their partnerships. They are friends who became business partners. Now, for some people, that is a great way to go and you're gonna be able to build a successful business with your business partner but for other people it's going to be challenging to actually make that work and regardless of whether it's a friend or not but having a partner in your business in general brings in different dynamics to your business because now you've got to break down the workload you've got to decide who does what in the business so I asked the guys what are some of the dynamics of having a partner in your business and how do you divide up the work and here it was their response Evan has not done nearly as much cataloging as I have so I'm just way faster at it um and that's probably why I keep doing it but yeah, we, we kind of just assign roles. Evan handles the coupons and feedback. I usually check the emails in the morning um, and then before I clock out, um, I usually do refunds as well, although sometimes Evan gets to that before me. Um, we both do everything, and if yeah. we needed to, like if Paul is going on vacation, I can catalog during the week or whatever mm -hmm. it might be, but uh, I think we found there's if with efficient, it's a little more efficient if Paul focuses on cataloging, packs orders, and then focuses on cataloging and a few other minor things, and then I focus on adding those pieces in addition to adding the other pieces that other catalogers have done. Um, and I think it's helped us to stay organized a little bit with I'm consistent how I add the parts and Paul's consistent how he catalogs. Um, so it, I think that's actually helped uh, streamline a few things as opposed to us splitting the work completely in half. Mm -hmm where I think it would actually be a little more difficult for us to stay focused on. So what we're seeing here is that when you have two people in the business, then breaking down the roles and responsibilities and dividing up the work 
is more efficient than trying to do a little bit of everything. But at the same time, the guys both know how to do everything. So it's important to also understand the role that your partner plays and what the work that they do is, because if one of them goes on vacation, the other one can still run the entire business. So Evan knows how to do the cataloging that Paul usually does. So although they are splitting the work up so that they can get better at each area and then they can have the efficiency gains that comes with that, they also fully understand the entire business together as a unit. And this is definitely how I also would recommend approaching partnerships. I have a partnership with my wife in our businesses and it's also how we do things. She's much better than I am at certain areas and I'm better than her in other areas, but we both know how to do most of the things in the business. And for that reason, the business can continue to run if one of us was out of action for whatever reason, then it is not completely dependent on that one person. So definitely how I also recommend to approach partnerships. Now, after this, I asked the guys, what about when you have your clashing with your partner? How do you approach that when you are friends, especially? And here was their response to that question. We've been on each other's nerves for the past 20 years, though. Um, yeah. So I think yeah, we're used to that. Scary. But um, uh, I would say one of the biggest things is Paul and I have this incredible ability to legitimately be yelling at each other and fighting and so angry with each other one minute. And then once that discussion's over, we can turn around and not even yeah. kidding, within a two minute period, be laughing about something. Um, and so that dynamic, I think, has helped tremendously when we're stressed because we spent way too much money this month or whatever, and we're fighting in the store or bickering or whatever. But the minute we go into the house and we're, we're just living, it's fine. Um, yeah. And I think that's helped a ton. Go Basically, ahead. if you can't leave your, if, if you have a friend and you're unable to leave your arguments on the clock out, then you probably should not go into business together. Um, and I mean, a pretty easy way to tell this is what's the longest stretch you've not talked to your friends because you've been angry at them? Right. If the answer is uh, over something that really is kind of trivial, if it's more than a couple of days, then you probably should not go into business together. Um, other things would be being unable to apologize, which is definitely something that I struggle with. I struggle to admit I'm wrong, but Evan will call me out on it and be like, no, you're wrong, you know, and then kind of push me until I apologize. But, you know, th that's kind of a, a big watch out for a business partner and anything, not just a friend. So really important call out here. If you are someone who wants to have a business with a partner, now this, they're talking about friendship, but this can also apply to a spouse. If you are starting a business with a spouse, it is so important to be able to separate the work from your home life. Because when you clock out of the business, you need to be able to enjoy each other's company, especially if you live together. And so the guys are talking about about the ability to actually have disagreements in the business but not let it impact your personal life. Disagreements in business with a partner is inevitable. It is definitely going to happen because everybody approaches things in different ways and has different visions and different approaches to different things. Some people have their off day where they don't get enough done. And the other person has higher expectations. It's just always gonna happen. But if you are able to disconnect at the end of the day and not hold grudges long-term, then it's super crucial. And if you are not, then maybe you should not be having a business partner at all. So I definitely agree with their approach here and their thoughts behind this. And that is important for any of us out there starting a business with a partner. And finally, one more quick interview that I want to jump to because this is another important lesson. And this is from Hugh Millington. And Hugh is the creator of the website Brickset.com, a very, very important website for us Lego investors and collectors and fans. And I asked a question to Hugh about you, what is something that you would tell a new business owner or someone who wants to start a new business? What is a general piece of advice that you would give them? Quite a broad question. I was curious what his response would be. And here's what Hugh said. I think you need to find your own niche. You know, it's brick set was lucky, I suppose, being there quite early on, finding a niche there with uh, lists of promotional sets that weren't available elsewhere and building that into a, a comprehensive database, which was better than anything else out there. So you've got to find your niche and find something that nobody else is doing and do it better than everyone else. And hopefully then when you've done that, your visitors will uh, come to you. But yes, it's not easy. As you've heard there, it took me seven years before I made a penny from the site. So I don't think you're going to get rich quick these days with um, with uh, much unless you um you know maybe these youtubers and instagrammers these days do but i don't know whether it's possible in the lego world but perseverance <laughs> yes and hard work 
That's what it sounds like. So what we are hearing from Hugh here is really that it's perseverance. It's all about sticking to it. Brickset.com didn't make any money for seven years and Hugh was still getting up every day and putting in that work. Now as resellers, as Lego investors and resellers, we get the benefit of actually not having to go and try to do our own marketing and get our own customers. And that really helps us to be profitable a lot sooner than seven years. But the point here remains, and what Hugh was saying is that it's not really a get rich quick thing. You know, if you're starting a business, you cannot expect to be driving a Lamborghini next year. That is just not realistic. What we need to be doing is have the long game in mind, have perseverance, have discipline, and then have an investing mentality or mindset, perseverance and discipline so that we can continuously grow this thing year in, year out until it becomes a six, seven figure business if that is your goal. And Hugh also mentions picking your own niche. Now, again, if you were someone starting a business where you're going out and doing your own marketing, you're selling services or different things, then picking a niche is gonna be even more important. As a reseller, as a Lego investor, it's a little less important in terms of actually getting sales. However, when it comes to mastering your niche, I always recommend this because it will make you better at what you do. That is why I recommend for new Lego investors to pick certain themes so you can get really, really good at Star Wars or Ninjago or Speed Champions or Minecraft or whatever it may be. That's about niching down so you can get really good at something and give you a competitive advantage. And that is the idea behind finding your niche when it comes to Lego investing and reselling. If you have a brick and mortar store, then maybe the niche is minifigures or it could be battle packs or it could be lessons that you give to kids every Saturday morning Morning. You can do something that other people are not doing that gives you competitive advantage. And so even though Hugh is in the niche of building websites, that still applies to us in the niche of selling Lego sets because we can also niche down further and pick specific themes or specific areas that we wanna work in and then we can become masters of that and become better than everybody else. So important lesson here from Hugh Millington from Brickset.com and across the board, some really, really important lessons about business and Lego business specifically. And I have tons of other interviews that I've done with really, really great people. I may make another one of these in the future to capture more of these great lessons. But for this one, thank you so much for being here. And if you wanna learn more about Lego investing. I wrote an entire book where I share all of my secrets for picking Lego sets. And that means what are the sets that have the best chance at going up in value? Now, you can get that book in the description down below. And while you're down there, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget to lift off and be free.